It's the Smart Driving Cars podcast. We are happy you could join us again. This edition is sponsored by the Smart ETF's Smart Transportation and Technology ETF, symbol MOTO. For more information, head to MOTOETF.com. Technical support is provided by CARTS, the Corporation for Automated Road Transportation Safety, a 501c3 corporation. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with the Faculty Chair of Autonomous Vehicle Engineering at Princeton University, Alan Kornhauser. Good morning, Alan. Hey, good morning, Fred. And with us once again, we're happy to welcome from Sweden, so we'll say good afternoon, consultant and publisher of The Dispatcher, Michael Senna. Hi, Michael. Good afternoon. Great to be back. Great to have you on every month now. I mean, this is great. And the reason he's here every month is because a new edition of The Dispatcher is out. And on top was the symposium on the future networked car held virtually with a theme moving towards automated driving. Give us the overview, Michael, maybe some of the highlights, quite a few sessions and and panels. Yeah, it was was held over four days, three hour, three hour sessions, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I moderated the session on uh, on Wednesday. Um, the highlights. After two years of COVID practice, we were finally able to uh, to manage to hold a symposium, which really did have a feeling of of almost being there in person. There were a few things that that uh, I missed, like being able to pull somebody from the audience and ask them a question that I knew they wanted to they knew they wanted to ask and you know, a zinger that, that, that would highlight, you know, bring a little zip into the, into the panel. But other than that, it, we, the tech, the, the technical aspects worked, people f- were, were engaged. It, it really did feel like a, like a, a live panel. Second highlight is that, you know, this ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, it's, it's uh, a UN organization, but it's, it's in charge of, of telecommunications. Well, for the first time that I, I've been going there, vehicle c- communications seems to have finally gone beyond DSRC, at least for everyone outside of the European Commission. Um, it, it's cellular V2X. That's, that's what it is. That's what's, what it's going to be. And that's where, where things are going. It would be nice if the, if the European Commission directorates who are in charge of the ITS areas got on board. But... You know, maybe the folks there who were, who were not will retire soon and other people can come in and take over. Well, um, well Michael, why not be subtle about this? Yes, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> if, you, if you really want to know how I'm feeling, just, you know, read my newsletter. <laughs> it sounds like you're advocating regime change, but that's another subject. <laughs> uh, you know, I stand behind my words. I, 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 didn't, I didn't misspeak. I, I actually meant what I said, uh, and I'd say it again if put it in the same situation. Uh, you know, does that cover that other side as well? It does. It does. Okay. So, what are some of the things you, that uh, that that we learned from the from these sessions uh, that that are at top of mind? Well, I, I hope that that the session that I had kind of covered many of the aspects of of the of things that we talk about: driverless, um, self driving types of cars. The, the title of the session was was. Um, Artificial general, general intelligence and the impact of, of that on on the on the future of, of self driving driverless cars, and I intentionally gave it that name, artificial general intelligence, because AGI is it's equivalent to to human. It's 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 everything up to the point of of a human being able to do certain things. And in, in our discussions, being able to drive a car anywhere at any time in any kind of car. Um, what the panelists in my session really did did do a very good job of is describing the difference between where we are today with, with artificial intelligence as a supplement to the kinds of, of systems and, and software that, that are being put in cars to improve safety, to a certain extent convenience, but primarily safety. And where we would have to be with AGI in order to get cars that could drive anywhere, anytime, in in any type of of situation. And there's a very large gap. And I think the reason that that this was the first time that that session was given, and the reason that I wanted to 
highlight the difference between AGI and AI, which is a component of AGI, was because there's so much work that's being done and, and so little, I think, appreciation for the fact that when people are talking about AI, they're not talking about artificial general intelligence. They're not talking about a car taking over the, the job of a human. They're, they really are, they mean and they, they, they infer both that certain things that we're doing with artificial intelligence in terms of, of gathering data and being able to use that data in vehicles to, to supplement the driver, to assist the driver, is, has come a long way. And it's, we've got a lot more to do. The, the main message amongst the people who were there was we need to be putting more money and more effort into those areas to improve safety and not so much money in the area of pushing people in the direction of, of fully driverless with auto, artificial general intelligence because there's there's such a large gap between where, where we would have to be in order for that to, to, to happen. And I think we got that message across. Alan, you you have thoughts yeah, well, about Michael, this. I mean, I think that's that's a, it's a great message to, to put across, um, because um, I, I guess you know the whole thought that that that, uh, that we can um, do a, a compute stack with sensors and actuators that can actually do what we do when we pay attention very well when we pay attention a lot of times we don't and therefore we get ourselves in trouble but but what we're capable of doing when we're focused on it is really powerful okay and and it's really tough and to get a stack to be able to do that as you put it we need the general intelligence piece of it because the general intelligence helps us as i like to say fight our way out of a paper bag if we happen to encounter that or something or you know i mean you know you just you have to pivot somehow you know how do you pivot when you know to bail yourself out and 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 so you know i guess we learn that as entities um, you know uh, birds learn that fleas learn that you know they it seems like you know most of the surviving species learn that um, whether or not the, the compute stacks that we put together so far do that, I mean, it's, it's almost laughable to think that, that they're even close. And so, you know, this aspiration that, that all of a sudden we're going to have a compute stack that can do all the things that we can do when we're paying attention, I, I think is, is, is a little bit silly, it's beyond silly at this point. Um, and, and, then, and then to take it even farther, especially th this is when I rile on this whole level five business that somehow the Society of Automotive Engineers put out there, you know, this everywhere, anytime. I mean, I can't drive my car everywhere, anytime, even if I do pay attention. And what was it, a couple of weeks ago in Missouri, what was there, 125 car bat pile up killing who knows how many why because you know they were trying to drive in the fog i mean come on you know i mean if you're gonna forget if, if it's fog stop okay i mean we can't even do that and 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 if if we're doing all this to solve the fog problem then we should define it as solving the fog problem uh, to me, I think there's so much more we can do with a with a compute stack that can drive some of the places, some of the time, to provide mobility for people. We should we should. It's about time we focus on that, and and then once we do that, then, then maybe we can take the next step. I, I think it's partially the way your 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 whole thing went. Correct. Yep. And that's the kind of thing that we're seeing today uh, in Arizona, California, some other places too, and from Cruz, Waymo, and some others. We're distinguishing that from being able to go anywhere, anytime. They're, they're very, those places are very limited, and, and they should be, and everybody should realize that. And, and I guess the benefit of the compute stack that we have now is that it knows whether or not it's in the operational design domain, okay? And even if the operational design domain is only this big, uh, fine, let's do it there. And then, and, then, and then make it bigger and make it bigger. But this business of, you know, where we can do it? Are you joking? 
I mean, I I, none of this stuff is close, correct, Mike? Yep, exactly. Well, exactly. let's turn let's turn to the dispatch central section of, of the new newsletter. On top there is the new OEM strategy: divide and conquer. And what we're talking about, uh, Michael, are, are spinoffs. Uh, yeah, spinoffs, or well. If you take Mercedes, Mercedes decided to, to break itself up into uh, a truck company and and um, and its its car company, and feeling that that it wasn't getting enough attention from the markets. I mean, the idea is that they they are thinking along the lines of of um, well, if you know if we can find some more hidden value in the corner of our of our production sites, we can get our stock to go up, and we can get you know. You know more money to be able to invest in everything that we need to invest in. So Mercedes went there and made made this division. Ford was very close to doing it, but backed away and decided instead of of breaking it up into separate companies that it would keep it would keep it as one company. I, I think that was a very good decision. I think we're gonna we're gonna find there there are so many strategies that that uh, you know that. Over the years, if if you were vertically integrated like the old Ford company, you were you were told that you have to concentrate on core competencies, and so they they companies began to come you know, focus on their core competencies, outsource, offshore, and what they found after a while was that the core was hollow, the offshore was dangerous, full of you know full of of uh, of um, dragons and and uh, and bears. Uh, and outsourcing just causes all kinds of problems that with uh, with being able to get the, the information and the data that you need. Besides giving away the the keys to the to the, the treasure trove that you've built up over the years, so now everybody wants to come back. But by coming back, you know the next stage is well, it, break it up into different different pieces because then you can you can be a Tesla. One of your businesses can be a Tesla, and the other business can be an old Ford, and 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 so on. And I think they're really missing the point. I mean, if you if if you really look at Tesla, we have discussed this many times in, in this in this, in this venue. They are totally vertically integrated. You know, the only difference is that that you know or the only separation is between between rockets that go to go to the, the space station and then you know and Mars and cars. So I, I I think you know the best advice that can be given to car companies these days is if you want to make money. Focus on what you can do well. Don't think that you're going to you're going to start to to just set, suddenly generate money because you're going to call yourself a mobility company. That hasn't worked well for anybody, including Mercedes Benz and BMW and Volvo and lots of other groups F and and Ford, NGM. You know, make good cars, sell good cars, maintain good cars. People will buy them. Yeah, that's that's the well, best. Advice. You know, again. Uh... <laughs> Being a complete novice uh, about about you know corporate America or corporate world, uh, but of course I'm an academic, so I'll throw in an opinion. Of course I would. Um, it it is rather amazing. I mean, you know, I think it's 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 appreciated and recognized that one of the reasons Ford did so well when he created Ford Motor Company was the fact that it was vertically integrated and it had all the pieces i mean it was it, it mined or he had a movie studio so so that he could promote the farm to market roads so that you know the cars that were built could go on roads and you know the the whole nine yards of that thing and and, and you know then then sort of the the public sector went in there and said break it up okay because because of course you're you're too vertically integrated. You have too much synergy in the various pieces, and and it's it strikes me that that you know I, I think I commented on it with respect to mobile eye possibly doing an IPO out of Intel. <clears throat> really, in other words, Intel wasn't able to do enough you know synergy with mobile eye that now it needs to spin it. And I saw as a you know thing in there. I mean, I sort of said, "What mobile eye wants to use Nvidia chips now?" I, I mean, I, I you know, I, as opposed, um, it, it it you know from a from a very basic you know uh, 
corporate America 101 type of thing or corporate world 101. It just seems like like the the reason you put these pieces together is because because you get such synergy between them to produce products that then generate profitability that then lead to high uh, prices on the stock exchange as opposed to let's let's break it up and and pump it up and put some lipstick on the pig and see if we can get somebody to buy stock where in fact we're not dry, we're not generating any profit and what we just care about the stock price I and mean, caring Intel's, about the stock prices i think yeah. the wrong way to to run a company I'm not, yeah exactly i, and, I and, have and, run one and i you know but it was a small one whatever but hey we the, the only money we made was money that we made because because we delivered value to a customer that was willing to pay Yes. Yeah. Okay. Michael. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say in, Intel is a, is a great example of a company that completely lost its way. I mean, it had the, it had the, you know, had the keys to, to, to the, to the castle and it just it threw them out and, and, you know, landed in a moat and then people are down there trying to pick them up. Intel is where it is today because it tried to do too many of the wrong things rather than doing the one thing that it could do really, really well. And it seems like the person who came in there to take over seem, has a better idea of what they should be doing. And maybe they're realizing that buying companies like Mobileye was just a really stupid idea in the first place. It doesn't have anything to do with what, Mo, what Intel should be doing. It maybe had a lot to do with Intel, with what people told Intel that they should be doing in order to raise the value of the stock. You know, these... There's so much bad advice out there and there's so many good people who have run companies who know what they should be doing, but they bring in people who, who have no idea and say, you know, we can get the value of your stock up so high that, you know, you, you'll be able to retire. Everybody in the, on the management will be able to retire and you'll all be you're great and stockholders will be fantastic and, you know, and the company's gone. So Intel, Intel should sell Mobileye completely and forget about it, as, as in forget about it. Oh, well, wow. A lot of yeah, a lot of people or investors yeah. would point to what they weren't able to do when it came to mobile processors. Yeah, exactly. How they were beaten. Yeah, well, you know, and all those things. In, in some sense, uh, I, I guess my partially my point is 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 that is that if you want high stock prices, be a be a more profitable company, produce something that people want to really buy and and, yeah. and get a lot of value out and rolling, get, yeah. reach in their pocket and give you money. Uh, don't do it using lipstick. Yeah. Okay, and they're and, they're and, missing. And they're completely uh, missing the point on on Tesla. They have completely missed the point on Tesla. They keep they keep using Tesla as the example of what you want to be, but unfortunately, the pe the people who are taking the advice are looking at you know, mobility as a service, and and all this other sh stuff. Tesla is selling a lot of cars. <laughs> you know, they're selling a lot of cars. I remember a couple of years ago telling my friends at, at, at Volvo, you know, have you seen the number of cars they're selling in the U.S.? They just passed you in, in the U.S. And, and Volvo sells, you know, they sell, had, were selling not that many cars. And Tesla went past them. And then they never looked back. You know, and then they, and they, Volvo had a, had a million cars as their, as their goal six or seven years ago and they're close they're 800 and you know 850 yeah. or so and, you know and tesla just zoom just went and and they keep going yeah tesla yeah i i, I think i think they deserve an enormous amount of credit they, they, they last year they had 79 percent of the market of in a sector Okay, that is non-trivial sector. Who else has seventy-nine percent of a market? So it must mean, and you know, it's not that that it's necessarily government subsidy, which there's a lot of government subsidy pumping up all the the other uh, um, uh, twenty-one percenters. You take the government subsidies of the twenty-one percenter. Tesla probably goes to eighty-nine percent uh, of, of of sales. And, and, and they're doing that. And, and you know, maybe, maybe people, people are buying it. 
people were buying them. There doesn't seem to be a, a, a enormous wave of people trying to sell them on the side to get rid of them and some and some. You can't even pick up a used one, I don't think. I mean, it's, yeah, it's like they, it's, yes, it's, you can. They, they're but, out yeah, there. No, but I, I know, you know, know, I've, I've know. had enough. Um, I've I've said enough negative yeah. about Tesla, yeah. for for and I think for a lot of good reasons. But yeah, when it comes to too. this point, their their stock value is not something that's made up. It's too, it's too high. Even, even Musk has said it's too high and he wants to split it. He wants to get out more shares so he can get the price down so more people can buy it. Good idea. But it's not there because, you know, they're selling candy, candy or, you know, they're, they're giving away something. They're selling cars that are expensive and people are buying them. Why is that such a difficult thing for Ford and, and Mercedes Benz and all these other guys to understand? Do your job, make a good car, Put it out there, people will buy it. I happen to buy Toyotas, but that's you know that's me. Another story, okay. Michael, that that you yeah. highlight to, to move along is headlined: UK investigating laws for driverless cars. So, explain this. What are some of the things being considered here? Yeah, this this is this is a really. It, it started with a with an article that I read that was a was. Um. The, the journalists had identified that the UK Department for Transport was not looking at changing a law. It was looking at changing the wording of a law that was put on the books in 1930 and the, um, the Road Traffic Act, 1930. The, the law had to do with dangerous and reckless driving. This is 1930. And that you you would be punished for dangerous and reckless driving. But the law wasn't very clear about what dangerous and reckless driving was. So it was very vague. And he said, you know, here's a law that's on the books that now the, the Department for Transport is going to change and make it specific. If you do this and you're caught doing this, you're going to be punished to the maximum. So People were misbehaving because, the, number one, they knew they could get away with it. And number two, because no one was enforcing it. And that's true everywhere. There's not enough enforcement. And number two, it wasn't clear what exactly it was you were doing wrong unless you were going through a red light. And even there, there's some, there's some fuzzy area. Going through a stop sign is probably a lot easier than going through a red light because you could always say, well, it was yellow and I didn't see it and so on. So here's, here's the example. It's a good law that's on the books and it's pre protecting vulnerable, dry, vulnerable uh, people. Not, not people in the car, but pedestrians, people on bicycles and so on. So that's, that's the, that got me thinking about the next part of, of what, I, what I wrote in, this, in, in my article. Um, it was that the UK department, UK government, had asked the Center for, for Connected and Autonomous Vehicles. This had been set up, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. Back in 2018, uh, they asked the Law Commission. There are two commissions in, in Britain. One is for Scotland and the other is for England and Wales. We think it's one country, but it's, we, we know it's not. Um, the two law commissions. They asked them to recommend regulations for highly automated vehicles. This is back in 2018. 2022, they went through a number of steps here. In 2022, they issued their report after going out and, and having you know, talks with people. And they, they issued the report. The report said, you need a new law. Now, this gets back to the first, the first thing I said. There are plenty of good laws on the books. We're just not enforcing them. They said, you need a new law. And the new law would be the, Auto, the Automated Vehicles Act. And in this Automated Vehicles Act, Automated Vehicles Act, it would make a clear distinction between cars that were driven by a, an, an individual and cars that were driven by the, the vehicle itself. In which case, the person who was in the car, there should be a person either in the car or somewhere else, would be the user in charge. And that user in charge would make sure that people had, had you know, put on their seatbelts, 
and we weren't doing nasty things or doing things to, to distract the the real driver and the real driver was would be the, the the robot and the second part of the recommendation was to set up a new authority who would decide who could be an authorized self-driving entity and this authorized self-driving entity would either make or sell distribute cars that could be driven by a robot and that there would also be a user in charge. So, so the two things here, something new, completely new. Now, and they gave these recommendations to the to the Minister of Transport, Transport Minister, who is now taking them under advisement, and then they're they're going to decide what to do. I think this is a clear, a very good example. I mean, it's 2018. It's taken them four years to come up with these with these two recommendations. In in going through all of the material that I that I read. And you know what the recommendations were, and the, and the background, and the questions. They're all over the place with with uh, with uh, terms. You know, autonomous and self-driving and driverless and user in charge and I mean all kinds of of things that are sprinkled throughout these documents, without any any sense of of trying to to pare them down and say this means this and and this means that. So now you've got an authorized self-driving entity deciding on connected and autonomous vehicles and user in charge who could be a person or could not necessarily be a, a person, physically a person. When they've got an act from 1930 that clearly states, if you misbehave, you're going to be punished. And someone making a very good, good decision to tighten up the wording in that act so that we can define misbehaving. And oh, by the way, in order to make, to, to, Get the perps, put more cameras in the cars. That's what that's what the the Department for Transport is saying. Put more cameras in the cars, put put more cameras on bicyclists' helmets, put more cameras on on you know people walking around so that, that you know if they get run over, they could they could prove that they're run over by somebody who is misbehaving. There, there's a there's a separation here between people who were who are thinking about connected and driverless vehicles and looking at it like this is something completely new. And those people who are saying, let's let's deal with what we have right now. Let's try to make make life better for people in cars and outside of cars so that we obey the rules, we obey the laws, and if you don't, you're punished for it. I feel like I was on a on a you know to know preaching to the <laughs> to the I know everybody's listening believes in this completely, but I just every now and then I feel like I've got to preach a little bit. We don't have any indication as to what's going to happen, what the outcome is going to be with, the, with no. these recommendations yet. No, we don't know. You know, the, the, the definitions and the terms being used and the misconceptions and who knows what one is talking about and, and so on. And darn it. And, and uh, you know, maybe I should take my hat off and again, uh, try to give praise to this Society of Automotive Engineers because they came up with the levels when maybe they tried to do this and so on and so forth. But, you know, we, we are in a mess with our terminology, okay? We're just in a complete mess. We don't know what to call self-driving. We don't know what to call driverless. We don't know whether it's connected. There used to be a real interest in, in, in thinking that, in fact, DSRC is going to give us the communication and connected is all about it and everybody's going to exchange information and when you know we move beyond that and so on the connected still hangs out there in front as i've argued they didn't even go alphabetical they connect call it connected and auto uh, a for who knows what the a stands for automated autonomous uh, who knows what i mean it's a complete mess nobody understands what I guess, you know, I've gotten, I've ended up, you know, in the corner that I'm in now, I'm just saying, look, I mean, if you're, if you're being driven around and something else is responsible for what the hell's going on, then damn it, you know, you're a passenger. 
And if, if you're the one that's responsible for what's going on, then you're a driver. And, and to me, the, the, maybe the responsibility aspect is who do you point to if somebody, something bad comes into play, you know, is, is kind of a way to, to separate these darn things. Uh, maybe, maybe not. I mean, I, I praised, I praised the last week, um, uh, Mercedes for apparently, and I still haven't run run it down in their so-called level three announcement uh, when you're going, you know, um, you know, two miles an hour in, you know, in, in, in a place where there are no pedestrians, no nothing, no nothing, perfect weather or whatever the operational design domain that they've defined, that their compute stack, their, their intelligence stack can determine what it is, you know, it keeps you in there, that they'll be responsible. Uh, but now, you know, people say, well, no, they didn't say that. They did say that. <laughs> we don't even know. But my goodness, I mean, you know, if they did, which I think they should, uh, if they're the ones responsible, then they're responsible. If they misbehave, then they're the ones that get put in jail. They have to pay, pick up the tab. They'd have to do that. If, if, and, and because I was a passenger, I was a rider. I keep arguing, you know, if I'm flying United Airlines over to whatever, or if I was flying East China, whatever, and we went down, you know, I'd be knocking on, you know, in Beijing on the door, say, hey, you know, compensate me. OK, <laughs> because or somebody whoever's but, but I wasn't responsible for that because I was a passenger in the darn thing. OK, I was I was getting a ride. As opposed to, you know, I'm giving a ride. You know, when I'm a driver in a car, I'm giving myself a ride. Mm -hmm. And what bugs me about that, you know, that driver is free because I'm not charging that driver. In fact, Madison Avenue has told me that, who I'm actually getting revenue from that because I'm enjoying myself so much because I'm driving. Okay, we won't go into that one, but I don't know. It, it's nobody under nobody knows what the hell is going on you don't know if you're getting in the vehicle am i responsible or am i not in some i guess in some of these situations it, who picks up the tab if something bad happens okay who goes to jail okay who gets prosecuted okay I guess because th th these are the penalties. If you enforce this 1938 or whatever law, you know, somebody, s s some entity has to pick up the tab, go to jail. What, talk to me here, Michael. Well, next, it, we can talk about this next month because that's yeah. the future article next month. Okay, we'll we'll do that. We'll table, yeah. okay? Because we want to we want to table that. I, it, to me, that's that's this is what I've said with full self driving. If Elon just said, "Hey, if anything bad happens, you know, call me. I'll take care yeah. of it." Okay. Yeah. If and he that's... did that, if he did that, I think sales would go through the roof. But he's not going to do that until that damn thing works because he doesn't want to go to jail. No, of course. Okay. Yeah. So therefore, the incentives are there. The incentives. And, and if somebody, if he's not willing to pick up the tab, then I don't have the confidence that it's going to work. Okay. You know, if United Airlines doesn't pick up the tab, I don't go to Newark and hop on. Okay. We will be back, <laughs> but this is a good time to remind you about our sponsor, the Smart ETFs, Smart Transportation and Technology ETF, symbol MOTO. To get more info, head to MOTOETF.com. On the website, look for the white paper called The Smart Transportation Revolution. It's under the Insights and News tab. Some great information there to help you make informed decisions about investing. ETFs, you may know, can be a smart way to spread risk with your investments and focus on a particular category of stocks. The website, again, is MOTOETF.com. We are back with more of Smart Driving Cars and our guest, Michael Senna. Michael, in another item from the latest edition of The Dispatcher, in the musings section, who said making cars isn't a political act? Yeah, I've gotten some, um, you know, I sent the issue out yesterday and I've gotten some thanks a lot. You know, we, we appreciate that, that you're using your platform to say something that everyone should be could be saying about what's going on in Russia and the Ukraine. And I, I, I put I put a lot of emphasis and time in this because I feel like many of, of us in this industry, we were 
sucked in. I mean, between 2007 and 2013, I spent a lot of time in Russia. And at the beginning, I felt, goodness, it's, it's, it's not the country that, that it was when I was growing up. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not the, the, they're not the bad guys anymore. It's, they're really trying to do something. And as, as, the, as the years went by, you know, I began to see that Putin was still behind the scenes pulling all the strings on the puppets. And now we, now we have a situation where companies who have spent enormous amounts of, of effort and money, and I pointed out Renault because they got in much deeper than anyone else. And now they're trying to dig themselves out of the, out of the hole that they dug for themselves. Up until a few days ago, they had said, nope, we're going to continue making cars there. We have, we're major investors in the biggest car company, Autovaz, and we're not going to do anything other than continue to support this this ugly regime that that has is killing people in uh, in its neighboring country for the only reason that that they don't want to be part of Russia's sphere they've now backed away from that and now they're saying well, we're going to try to to divest ourselves of autovaz and then we can't continue to to you know support this government but what I wanted to do in this article was, was to also put some perspective on, on how it happened, how we got to this point, how all of these companies, there were no companies investing in, in, Soviet, in the Soviet Union car, car, car business. It all happened post 1990 and actually post 2000. It was when, when people began to feel that they, could, they, they saw a market, they could begin to sell cars. And this is, this is Ford, this is GM, this is Volvo, this is all of these car companies. But unlike Ford and GM and, 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 uh, and Volvo, Renault said, nope, you know, we own Autovaz. We got in there because we think there's a market and we're not going to get out. We're going to continue to do this. But then they backed away. That's great. Stellantis, on the other hand, said, no, we've got a van company there. We're going to continue making cars. Now we're here. We can't get supplies. We're going to have to stop production. So, you know, this is an article I felt that I had to write now. I had it in the, in the, in the pipeline for something, you know, later. I felt that I had to put it out there now because it's, it's, it's totally topical. So, well, you know, it, it is topical, and we've commented, that I've commented on it. I've I, we pointed out last week that you know, uh, you know, one of my best all-time students, uh, um, Henry Posner the Third, is uh, running trains, his trains it's through Germany, you know, yep. taking uh, refugees out. I mean, he's his family has invested heavily in in the past in in Ukraine to you know. Um, rehabilitate um, Jewish um, synagogues and, and cemeteries. Uh, he started that who knows how many years ago and so on. So, and of course, I think um, my father was born there. So anyway, um, absolutely. Okay. The, the problem with Putin's incursion in the Ukraine is if you really look at it, 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 it can so easily lead to 7 billion people dying. I mean, this yeah. is fundamentally crazy shit. Yeah. Sorry, folks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it can't be called anything else. Yeah. Because if, if somebody does that, and then we say, oh, no, you don't. And he says, oh, yes, I do. Then there's only one thing that happens, ba ba boom, and 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 you can't you can't just do one. I mean, I you know, I even made my students uh, earlier this year um, uh, watch you know uh, Doctor Strangelove again. It is. I mean, my students have no idea Doctor Strangelove. No idea, no idea. Kubek, when he wrote that, what a movie, okay? Everybody should watch that, okay? Everybody should. And it's amazing we haven't gotten there in all these years. No, when was that done? That was done, 
Well, it was done when Kennedy got got assassinated. Why? Because, you know, what he said, what what's his name said in the pilot? He said, he said, we're gonna have a good time in Dallas. They couldn't release the movie because he said Dallas, because they were gonna release it right after the Kennedy assassination. They couldn't say they were gonna have a good time in Dallas. They had to, you can actually tell when you go over it that they they, they, at the time, you know, you couldn't do much. They put it, they change it to Vegas. But you can see with his lips, he's saying Dallas. Mm. Okay. Yeah. You know, you know, how long ago was that? Well, it was right after, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is amazing that we didn't, you know, kill whatever, 5 billion people that existed on the planet at that time. And if Curtis LeMay would have done, you know, what he wanted to do and convinced Kennedy, or at least that's my opinion, then, you know, we wouldn't be here. And this is crazy stuff. For what? Okay. Now maybe, you know, we did too much and whatever and so on. So I don't know, but I mean. But know, what, what the, the real point, crazy the stuff. real point here is that in, in this, this little newsletter that I put together, I've been saying things like this about different situations that we have in the in the in the world today, and I mentioned also mentioned China. You you cannot make a decision that you say is not a political decision; it's a business decision. If you look at the the reason that Putin was able to do what he did and has gotten as far as he's gotten, is because a former chancellor, partially a former chancellor of Germany, became one of Putin's puppets and allowed. Germany to get themselves in a situation where they're totally dependent, totally dependent on Russian gas, not one pipeline, two pipelines. And the people who were there, including Angela Merkel, everyone thinks wonderful woman, terrific politician. I've said this before, and this is not new for people who, li who were listening to me talking. She was part of the problem. She saw the opportunity to bring Germany into the fold, but she didn't see what, what it was going to lead to. And, and this is the same, the same is true for everybody who's out there taking money from, from Russia and money from other countries to promote environmental, environmental causes. But what they're really doing is they're putting these countries into a much stronger position. I've got the, I've got the, the figures in the, in the, the report, how much gas oil and coal is being sold by Russia into the European Union today. And then what you've, if, you've got the, if you've got these countries, if you've got a hold of these countries like this, you can do pretty much whatever you want to do. And that's what, that's what Putin thought he would be able to do. But suddenly somebody else comes into the picture and says, you know what, all these things that you were being promised by the former president of the United States, the former guy, that no longer applies. We don't play that game anymore. Now we're playing this game. And this game is, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna strangle you. We're going to take all of your economic muscle away from you so that you can't be in a position to do what you're doing to, to Europe right now and the Ukraine and the rest of Europe right now. Well, you know, I, I, I certainly hope, <clears throat> again, I certainly hope all of that works. And, and I, I guess I thought that we had evolved from 19... 38 or whatever, uh, and so on, that in fact, you know, the, the economic uh, structure of the world economy is the thing that's really important, not how many nuclear weapons you have. And that the way that you really play, play the game properly is, is you get together and you have, uh, I guess, good international trade and you share and whatever, and everybody prospers. It was almost, yeah. it was almost you know, a godsend that that happened. And, 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 you know, the New York Times a couple of weeks ago had the charts <clears throat> that show, you know, the amount of energy that each of the company, each country is dependent upon uh, Russia to get. I mean, Hungary, it's Hungary is like 100 percent poor. Hungary is like totally screwed. I mean, totally dependent. Uh, Germany yep. was, I don't know, 20 some 30, whatever, a non-trivial number you know, energy, okay, is coming out of there that, and what are we doing buying oil 
from Russia. Really? I thought we had, I, I thought we were, I thought we were net exporters. Two percent. Well, well, why even two percent? Exactly. I, I, I mean, I mean, why? Where's what happened? I mean, this cartel that exists, you know, that that somehow makes it so, you know, they they collect all the money and distribute it. I, I, who knows how in the hell it works? I mean, come on, break, damn it. And and I guess Biden yesterday, you know, said that that he's opening up. Uh, you know, let's flood the world with oil and put them out of yeah. business. I mean, come on, cut it out. If you're going to use this to be able to then go, you know, do what you're doing, so that the only other alternative you have is this, you know, and hitting the button. This is crazy stuff. And one other point I want to make again, you know, I'm actually starting to eat ha- McDonald's hamburgers again. I just thought McDonald's was, I, you know, I can't praise them enough because at least they're the first ones that I heard about that said we're closing. They were basically the first ones in, in Russia in 1990 or whenever the hell they went in there as soon as they yeah. had the opportunity. And damn it, they deserve a hell of a lot of credit, at least from my point of view, from what I know. They were basically the first ones to come out. So, you know. Eat all the McDonald's hamburgers that you can, damn it. Or, I think they I have guess, salads maybe. too. But <laughs> <I don't laughs> yeah. Yeah. Alan, one one news item I want to turn yeah. to yeah. quick yeah. before yeah. I have yeah. to run. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Waymo yeah. making some news, uh, offering uh, employees in San Francisco now fully autonomous rides, saying they're going to expand that. And in Arizona, they're going to go into downtown Phoenix with, uh, with their rides. So I guess yeah. uh, some kudos to them kudos to them but my goodness why don't you come where you'll be appreciated and that would be i'm the trenton i mean seriously <laughs> i mean okay i'm i'm glad you're able to go and you know go down the the one-way street or the dead end street in san francisco so they don't call the cops on you and whatever uh but you know unfortunately i still think that the markets that they're serving are markets that already have darn good mobility for folks and, and you're just providing another alternative and, you know, and whatever, great. But once you come someplace where you'll really be appreciated, but again, kudos for doing it. Uh, hope it expands to be so great that you'll want to do it in Trenton too. And more about that in the upcoming <laughs> summit, which is early June of this year. So right. you can head to, to smartdrivingcar.com for more. We want to thank our guest, Michael Senna. Always great, Michael. Thank you. Always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Hey, hey, thanks, Michael. And thanks for everything you're doing. And I guess, you know, we continue to, you know, try to do good. The website is michaelsena.com. Thanks to our sponsor, the Smart ETFs, Smart Transportation and Technology ETF. The ticker symbol for the ETF is MOTO. More info is available at MOTOETF.com. Technical support is provided by CARTS, the Corporation for Automated Road Transportation Safety, a 501c3 corporation. You can find us, as we said, at smartdrivingcar.com, on Anchor FM, Spotify, TuneIn, wherever you turn to for podcasts. You can get your smart speaker to play us too. My tech reports are at textination.com. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with Alan Kornhauser. Thank you for listening or watching. Please stay safe. Everybody have a great April. Don't get April fooled too much. Uh, We did this before April Fool's so that we wouldn't be April fooled.